Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction also earlier, and uh, thanks for uh, uh, letting us present, uh, letting me present our work here. So, so um, what my lab is interested in in a larger context is, uh, is the genetics of brain development and brain function, both in health and disease. And uh, so the, the work that I'm going to show today really grew out of um, a collaborative project that we have with a group at, uh, with several groups, mostly led by the Vaccarino group at Yale, uh, where we're looking at, um, at the genetic basis of autism using IPS cells uh, made from, uh, from families with autistic children. However, what I'm going to show you today actually has uh, nothing further to do with, uh, with autism. We just used this, uh, 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 un unbeknownst to us in the beginning, we used this, uh, uh, these families as a discovery set for the, uh, for the somatic variation that, that I'm going to talk about. So, um, so when you work with IPS cells, uh, there is some worry about genomic instability. There are some reports about de novo CNVs um, uh, coming. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a thin literature still, but there are some reports that there might be some instability induced during the reprogramming uh, and then in IPS tissue cultures. So when we started this project, we decided that in addition of sequencing the um, the genomes of the uh, patients on the fibroblast level, at we, as we had planned of doing anyways, uh, we would also sequence them, so not just on the fibrous level, but we would also sequence them on the IPS level. Um, and we also did RNA sequencing. We had um, IPS from seven probands, uh, two families, each with one child with autism. And uh, we had a total of 20 clonal IPS lines. So in most cases, we got three uh, IPS lines out of these fibroblasts. Um, and the IPS work was all done at Yale. And then we did retest and paired end analysis, of both for the discovery, well, no, yeah, for the discovery of CNVs in both IPS and uh, the fibroblast genomes. And this work was all uh, published recently uh, in, in December last year uh, under Abit Sof et al. So, um, so when you have Whole genome, uh, whole genome sequencing data. What we had was we did Illumina high seq sequencing, two times hundred nucleotides, and we did about we did one lane for each sample, so for the fibroblasts and the corresponding IPS lines, which gave us about 10x coverage, which is not quite uh, as deep as you want it to be for let's say point mutation discovery, but it's very adequate for a read depth analysis. Uh, we used the CNV data algorithm um, to detect. Uh, copy number changes in the genome. And then wherever possible, we also did confirmation by paired end analysis, which is, again, 10x is not quite good enough to have full confidence if paired end analysis does not show a CNV. But uh, in many cases, you will get a, a CNV detected by read depth analysis, confirmed by a paired end read. And then, uh, then you have this additional confirmation. And also, you then have a much higher resolution a breakpoint call. Overall, we think this. Uh, combination uh, of approaches gave us a good sensitivity of detection of uh, CNVs down to uh, at least five kilobase pairs uh, in many cases we had. And then again, if you have a paired end confirmation, your, your prediction is uh, accurate to two, three hundred base pairs even uh, in terms of where the exact breakpoint junction is, uh, the breakpoints and the breakpoint junction. This is a, uh, showing here is a, is a representative plot. So we have a we have a read depth track here uh, from the whole genome sequence data for the fibroblast uh, DNA. And then we have, in this case here, showing two IPS lines that came out of this fibroblast line, uh, one showing no additional CNV and one showing, within just a few million base pairs, two additional relatively large duplication CNVs. Uh, so that was the overall discovery approach. And then um, for these CNVs that we detected this way, we did extensive validation. We did qPCR. We did array CGH. Uh, I'm showing some qPCR results here, but essentially it was just, you know, most cases it, it was good enough to just confirm uh, large CNVs like this, and, and, and we left it at that. Um, and then we also did extensive PCR and, of course, DDPCR uh, validation and quantitation, and I'll get to that in a moment. Overall, we found using this approach, in these 20 IPS lines, we found a total of 74 of these LMCNVs. And this is a term that we came up with. Originally, we, we, we would call them de novo CNVs, de novo as in de novo in the IPS lines relative to the fibroblast sample that they were derived from. But as you will see, a lot of them we then determined to be actually somatic and unmasked variants. 
and so we didn't want to put too soon a label on, on, on them. And so LM stands for lineage manifested CNVs, meaning it's a CNV we see in the IPS lineage. And we don't want to say up front whether it, we want to determine at first whether it is a somatic unmasked variant or an actual uh, the result of genomic instability during reprogramming. Uh, the median size of these uh, LMCNVs uh, we found to be a 50 kilobase pair, so that's like medium-ish size CNVs. Norm you find them in, uh, in, in the normal human genome, you find a few of this size uh, in every normal human genome. And of those 74, we found that 44 are overlapping with known genes. Um, now, what, what is important to keep in mind is when you make these IPS lines, you have a, you have a fibroblast uh, biopsy, you, you, you take it from the patient or the, the donor, uh, you, you culture it only two, three uh, cycles, uh, passages, passaging cycles, and then you grow, uh, you, cl you, you pull out essentially a single cell. It's, it's a clonal selection step, and then you, ex you extend that single cell and reprogram it into, uh, into, the, into the IPS, uh, um, into, into your IPS culture. Um, and, uh, and w as we were doing this, we would then stumble. This, this was actually the event that, that, uh, that, that, made us, that gave us pause and made us think, well, as we're seeing these things, maybe it's not all, uh, uh, all caused by uh, genomic instability during this reprogramming step. So here again is the, is the, uh, is the uh, whole genome uh, read depth track coming from the fibroblasts. Um, and then we saw in two of the derived lines, we saw this duplication event that uh, that uh, looked very similar, uh, even though they were two independently derived lines. And then the, a third line derived from this fibroblast, the same culture had no event. But because of the high accuracy of the sequencing-based uh, CMV breakpoint calls, uh, we were able to, to design PCR primers that, that would go across the, these LMCNV junctions uh, and, uh, and pull out a fragment. And then you can sequence this fragment and at first we did only these two PCRs. You get a nice strong fragment, you, you sang a sequence it, and you have the exact breakpoint sequence down to the nucleotide. Now what we saw in this case was that actually these two breakpoints of independently derived IPS lines uh, had the exact same nucleotide breakpoint sequence, which is just very unlikely if they are two independently occurring uh, de novo CNV events during reprogramming. And, and so now since we had this uh, working primer pair, we took it and applied it to, the, uh, to this DNA where you don't see an event in the, uh, in the fibroblast DNA. But sure enough, you do get a band, albeit a much weaker band, whereas you get no band uh, uh, in, in either this uh, line or in a control line. So um, with PCR, with these cross-junction primers, we can then detect what we now started believing was uh, low-frequency mosaic CNVs in fibroblast tissue that get unmasked during the process of, of making these IPS lines by going through either single cells or at least just a small number of cells that, uh, that then of which then probably one becomes dominant in the IPS line. So this is then where, where DDPCR came into play and now we wanted to know can we, can we actually uh, quantitate the exact frequency or as exact as possible of, uh, of a given LMCNV uh, in, in the somatic uh, fibroblast tissue, or at least the fibroblast culture, the, the, the low passage fibroblast culture. Um, we've, we've already heard a lot about how digital droplet PCR works, so I don't, I don't need to repeat that. Uh, this is uh, the same case again that I just mentioned with uh, three derived lines uh, from one fibroblast tissue uh, uh, showing the exact uh, same uh, CNV in two of the lines. And then, oh, th and what I'm illustrating here is, well, two things, I guess, A, my skills as a PowerPoint graphics artist, but also, <laughs> really, <laughs> this looked less ugly and small, but, uh, <laughs> but really what I'm demonstrating here is, is what, what another benefit that we had when we were doing this, uh, or another benefit coming out of having the exact breakpoint sequence of, let's say in this case, a deletion, because we had sequence across it, was that we could design the, the fluorescent probe for the digital PCR such that normally when you do this in, let's say, a large deletion, as we've heard uh, just before, where you're not entirely sure yet where the, where the endpoints are, you don't have the exact sequence, you will, you will drop this, this triad, the two primers, and the fluorescent probe somewhere, ideally a bit, f a bit away from the presumed breakpoints. And then you will still get a signal even from, uh, let's say, if it's a heterozygous deletion, you will still get a signal from the, from the remaining allele uh, 
so you're looking for then copy number changes. What we can do here is we can get essentially a yes no answer where we put the fluorescent probe directly on the breakpoint sequence, uh, roughly uh, having, this th having the, the probe sequence on either side of the breakpoint. And this way, we can get a signal, if we do this right, we will get a signal only if there was a deletion. Uh, or this also works for duplication, if you have the exact insertion sequence. Now, this doesn't work always, uh, because sometimes the, the, the region in this exact uh, a spot is just too repetitive or for whatever reason you can't get a clean probe design so then we would do the more standard approach and drop our probe right in the middle of, of the LMCNV. So as I mentioned clonal selection uh, or selection based on small cell numbers leads to unmasking. Uh, this is uh, this is what's our first example. Uh, what I wanted to mention uh, uh, is that because of this we think that it's extremely unlikely, although to really rule it out, we need to go back and do this from really completely uncultured fibroblast tissue, which is in the works, but, uh, uh, but it's a separate project. But we think it is extremely unlikely that, um, that what we're looking at are actually uh, artifacts that happen during the two or three or four passage cycles of the fibroblast culture, um, because A, it is a very low passaging number, and B, as I'll show in a moment, these, uh, and, and this particular CNV, for example, uh, was found in about 13% of the cells. And it's just very unlikely that you get, uh, you get such an event occur in the fibroblast culture and then take over 13% of the culture in just two or three passaging cycles. Uh, digital PCR, again, the principles are now known. And then for this very example right now, um, this, was, uh, this is an ex exemplary result where you get you get your control uh, no your control signal here and your your um, your LMC and V signal here. You do multiple replicates. Here we did we had two good replicates coming out of uh, IPS line, one of the two IPS lines that showed the duplication. Uh, we got three good replicates out of the other one, and this is how it then. So then taking that same probe to the fibroblast DNA, this is then how uh, how the signal for the for the CNV probe drops. So it's still there, but it drops relative to the control probe. And then you, so you, you, you then compute a ratio or ratio of ratios, and you come out with, a, with an allelic frequency, somatic allelic frequency for, for your somatic variant. In this case, about 13%. I'm just showing two more examples here, where, um, which actually kind of bracket our, the extreme of distribution that we found so far. Uh, here's, a, here's a case of a chromosome 7 duplication. Uh, not showing in the fibroblast signal, showing in the IPS signal. Um, PCR again gave a the sa normal PCR gave a, across the insertion point gave a very strong signal uh, in the in the IPS cell uh, and gave a weak band indicating somatic mass somatic variation in the in the fibroblast cell. And digital PCR pulled that out. Also, you have the have the IPS signal here and the fibroblast signal here, and you see the drop. And this comes out to uh, 15, roughly 15% frequency. Roughly 15% of the cells in that culture have, uh, have this. Uh, have this. 15% uh, of the cells in this sample actually have this variant. You just can't see it on the read depth track. Um, and this is the other extreme of our distribution, where uh, here's it's a deletion on chromosome 8. Nothing visible in the fibroblast uh, uh, genome uh, in that locus. Uh, a clear deletion in the CNV uh, mapping from the from the one this one IPS line, strong PCR signal. In this case, we got no PCR signal uh, f for the for the fibroblast DNA. So we thought, well, this might be one case where it is actually a, uh, a an artifact of the tissue culture. But then digital PCR was able to pull that out and come up with a, with a frequency, just a very low frequency. So only about one percent of the cells in this fibroblast culture have this particular CNV. So you can't even see it with regular, uh, with regular PCR. But we're still confident in this because we, we did also uh, try these, uh, uh, these um, digital PCR probes in, in, cell, in multiple cell lines where we had every reason to assume, or at least in enough, that we could be confident that they shouldn't all have this particular CNV. And if it's really not there, then there's really not even a residual signal. It's just really zero. So, so this 1% signal as, uh, seems credible to us. So that's already uh, my summary. Um, 
we have uh, we, we performed this uh, this combined integrated genomic analysis in uh, 20 IPS lines from seven probands, and this way discovered 74 uh, lineage manifested CNVs manifested in the IPS lines. Uh, mostly discovered by whole genome read depth analysis, about 30% of them supported by paired ends. Then we did extensive further analysis with various orthogonal methods, uh, had overall very high validation rates, and about in at least 50% of these uh, 74 LMCNVs, we could determine with the follow-up analysis that they were already present as mosaic somatic variants in the fibroblast DNA. That doesn't mean that the other 50% are not present. We just couldn't uh, find uh, a, a good spot to, uh, to put PCR primers uh, and digital PCR primers. Well, you, you need a good PCR primer first, and then you can drop the digital PCR probe in there. Um, so we don't know yet what, what the exact number is here, but in about 50% of the cases, we already could make that determination. Uh, and, and our range of mosaic allele frequencies so far is from, one to from about 1 to about 15%. Cumulatively, based on all of that, we estimate that about 30% of skin fibroblasts, you will find small numbers, meaning very small numbers, meaning usually one or two or three of these somatic CNVs um, we don't, the interesting question, of course, is now, well, there's two. One is how does this play out in other tissues, maybe tissues where it would conceivably have a much, much stronger impact, and obviously we're looking at the brain now, as are others. Uh, and then following from that, is there any physiological or pathophysiological relevance? We, what I didn't show, because I usually don't have time for it, um, is, uh, is we also did RNA sequencing in these lines and we looked at the expression of uh, genes that are affected in their copy number by these uh, LMCNVs and, and, and it is affected uh, generally in concordance with the direction of the copy number change as you would think, although it's interesting that it's not always the case. I mean, sometimes you have a deletion and the gene in that deletion will actually go up in its expression and vice versa. Uh, but that's the minority, I would say, maybe less than 10% of the cases. Usually a deletion leads to drop in expression level. Um, however, we didn't see, we didn't see genome-wide expression changes, so no dramatic network effects, uh, which, is, which is comforting, of course, if you want to use these IPS lines for really the disease study that you had in mind. And also, so far, there are now ongoing uh, 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 experiments with actually using these, uh, these IPS lines in differentiation and neurophysiological experiments, and so far there are no adverse effects on neuronal differentiation that we can, that we can discern. Um, having said all that, it's still something that we think, or we will certainly keep in mind going forward as we work with IPS. Uh, it might still, in some more or less subtle uh, way, this phenomenon of unmasking somatic uh, CNV might in some subtle way uh, influence the outcome of your IPS-based, IPS model-based study. So for the time being, uh, we're just keeping a close eye on this. Every time we make a new line, we, we, uh, we try to determine, do we have any, any extreme load of these LMCNVs that become unmasked? And, and we'll see in the long run what, what effect we have to deal with here. This is, I think, my last slide. Yes, yeah, so just, you know, kind of as a wider wider picture, somatic gem uh, genomic variation, how common is it and how relevant? This is just grabbing a few uh, titles going back only really maybe two years or so, and they were now all of a sudden uh, a reasonable number of often relatively high profile publications that, uh, showing that there seems to be more of the somatic variation going on in the human body than, than was previously thought, or at least than it was previously simply uh, possible to prove or disprove, whereas now that we have these uh, powerful genomics methods, the sequencing and, and digital PCR and, uh, and also the computational methods to deal with the data. We're starting to see more and more of this. Uh, so it will stay interesting for the next few years. Uh, we will, we, will uh, we, the community, will map this uh, and then eventually also determine whether there's any actual physiological or pathophysiological relevance. And just last slide, my acknowledgement. So Alexei pulled this project together and it was Michael Haney, who really worked out the digital PCR uh, uh, aspect of it, and then with, uh, also together with Alexei. And Michael got uh, started on this by, uh, by our very own, uh, or by Stanford's very own, Jennifer Lipukthan and Maeve Hulahan, who was at the time also in the Snyder Lab. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is a transcontinental collaboration at Yale, really led by, uh, by Flora Vaccarino and her group. 
with involvement by the Gersting Group and the Weizmann Group. And then here, again, it's the Snyder Lab where, uh, where a digital PCR machine was readily available for us. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, if there's any question, I'd be happy to answer them or try at least. show the probe design to detect the deletion, but I guess I'm lost a little bit because you're looking to detect the amplification, right? And, and so I guess, right? Well, that was, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we had to mix, right? We had, I actually don't remember. We know of, uh, it's, of course, somewhere in the, in, the, in the paper. We had both deletions and duplication. Okay. So it was just, give, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Please. So, so granted, you, so you have a copy number variation here. Um, do you suspect that it's a tandem copy? Uh, you said it was like 50 KB or so. Um, if it's 50 kb, you're not going to be able to resolve that by fish. Uh, if it were farther away, you might be able to. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd actually consider going back to the original fibroblast to do fish. But if they're so close together, you're not going to be able to resolve it on fish. Mm, yeah. So, so you are you are you wondering about the probe design strategy no, I'm not or? I'm just wondering about just understanding the copy number uh, variation that you detected and the size of it because by next gen sequencing, um, you don't get any. You often let me actually make sure I get this right here. Actually, no, you will. So you suspect it's going to be a tandem arrangement. Otherwise, you presumably looked at your next gen sequencing for um, places where this copy might have inserted itself, where you mm. would have found unexpected junctions. So you looked for those unexpected junctions and probably didn't see them. Therefore, they're tandem, more likely. So, so, uh, so, so, you, so. So the question of how exactly does a duplicate, in the deletion cases, that's why I chose the deletion. Right. It was obviously hard enough for me to make this graph, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, this graphic. But uh, in the deletion case, it's relatively easy. Once you have a good enough uh, deletion prediction, right, you know how to put your PCR primers. So you're, you're, you're pointing out that if you have a duplication, if you just see the upspike in the, in the um, CNV signal, you don't know where that extra fragment landed and how we dealt with this. Or right, so there should be a chimeric end somewhere, which doesn't really right. make sense. Exactly, um, but you don't, you wouldn't see that in the in the read depth mapping. If you're lucky, you have a paired end fragment that just supports the read depth signal, and then you know immediately also where to place your PCR primers. In cases where you don't have that, what you can do is you place one uh, primer. In just inside of the predicted duplication, and then on the outside you have what is called a vectorette uh, 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 adapter, or it's really it's a really uh, a universal adapter. You just fragment your genomic sequence, and you attach the universal adapter. So you prime from the one side with the universal adapter, and from the other side with your with your specific probe. And then once you get a signal, you sequence that. That works in some cases. Um, I actually don't know what the breakdown was here. I, I sus or I don't remember at least. We, we went, I mean, the, the, the clear tandem ones were, were the ones that we got went after first. But, and you're right, they, they are too small to, to, do it, to go after them by fish, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>